Hey guys, how's it going? Today we're going to be hopping right into Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a bit of an infamous map among casual players. There's a lot of side objectives that we need to complete, and they're under some pretty tight turn restrictions. However, the main complaint that you'll see levied at this chapter is the force of backtracking that happens about halfway through. One of the side objectives also has a bit of random number reliance. Despite these concerns, I do think this map's pretty interesting. It's a pretty linear map, all things considered. We can't do any of the castles out of order. However, due to the positioning of some of the castles, we can get some of our slower units who would normally not be able to do anything on a map the chance to shine for a bit. Starting off, you may have noticed we have a new unit in our army. His name is Holland. Holland joins once a unit has cleared the seventh stage of the arena once. This does lead to something interesting, as Holland is the seventh arena counter that you would normally fight. But once he's defeated, it's replaced by another counter who is notably harder. A lot of units have trouble with the seventh arena, so it's important to decide who's going to be the one to recruit Holland. We chose Azel in this run, since Azel would have extreme difficulties with the alternate counter. However, Lex might also have been a viable option. Holland as a unit is very similar to Ira. His stats are a bit higher, but he has all the problems she does, which means he doesn't really do a whole lot. One thing that is interesting about him is enemies like to target him when he's unpromoted. This trick isn't all that useful, but we will be using it once during this chapter. We didn't really trade many items around in the pre-chapter, and all the new shop items went to who you'd expect. We did, however, give the magic and skill rings to do, and there's a good reason for this that we'll get into when it becomes relevant. We had Deirdre talk to Ethlyn, and Ethlyn received the Light Brand. This is probably the most important weapon in the entire run. It's a 12 might sword that can be used by any sword wielding unit that uses a 14 might magical attack at ranged. This magic attack is also considered to be light magic, so it has advantage on all magic types but dark. We want to start building kills on the sword right away. Although Ethlyn isn't our strongest combat unit, she's still serviceable, so we're going to be feeding as many kills as we can to her. The first castle we're going to be taking this map is a castle which I believe is pronounced Herhein. On the way though, Sigurd's going to have to make a pit stop to recruit a unit at the green castle. We're going to be splitting our attack force up into two teams. Quan and Sigurd are going to go through the center to help defend the green castle, while Ethlyn, Finn, and Midir are going to go around the top. There's a big long stretch of road tiles in front of our castle which serves as a good demonstration for the problems that foot units face in this game. Because of the way road tiles are coded, you actually gain more movement out of them the more movement you have. Many casual players can have trouble understanding why foot units are so scrutinized in these games when their movement difference isn't that much on a turn-by-turn -turn scale. However, when you have a lot of turns where units are able to move their maximum movement, it starts to accumulate over time. And basically anybody that doesn't have cavalier movement at the start of this map isn't really going to be able to do anything for us in the first few castles. One of the issues people have with defending this green castle is the green paladins, which tend to get killed. Now, normally we wouldn't care about green units dying, but if all these units survive, we get a really important item at the end of the map, so it's essential that we keep them alive. The problem is, as soon as we recruit the green unit named Lachesis, all the paladins are going to break away from their defensive position, and they have a chance of getting themselves killed. In a more casual run, you can wait an extra turn to recruit Lachesis. This will keep the Paladins in their defensive position, and you can keep them alive 100% of the time. However, since we can't afford to waste a turn, we are going to have to rig at least one dodge on them. One nice thing the foot units are able to do is contribute to Edain's staff grinding. Edain still needs to promote by the end of Chapter 3, so we're going to have units sort of line up to be warped back to the home cast by her, and then run back over so they can be warped again. This is a fairly well-known strategy that people employ to grind staff uses up in a ranked playthrough. I said last map that Yamke would have a role to play, and here it is. Because Yamke is the worst combat unit in the game, combined with the fact that he has no utility whatsoever, he is the perfect unit to leave behind in the arena to burn random numbers. Unlike Arden, he doesn't have advantage, so with a broken weapon, he'll constantly die in one hit, so we can burn RNG precisely, and not accidentally skip over a chain that would be beneficial to us. So the new unit we got, Lachesis, is a pretty important unit in this run. Despite right now appearing to just be Ethelyn but worse, she has a pretty gnarly promotion. We're going to be spending a lot of time on this map trying to get as much experience as possible on her because she needs to promote by the start of the next map. 
The green unit's AI can be pretty annoying. They have the targeting AI and survival instincts of a standard red unit. However, they like to stay next to their commander, who in this case is Lachesis. Unfortunately, we're going to need to expose Lachesis to a lot of combat to train her up, which means these guys are also going to experience a lot of combat. For this reason, we're going to need to make sure our combat is quite efficient so they don't get ganged up on and killed. We want Quan to kill the boss, Elliot, because he drops the Silver Lance, which only Quan can use right now. The Silver Lance is one of the strongest lances in the game, and it serves as a quite needed damage boost to Quan. One thing we can start talking about now is how the experience works in this game. There are three ways that you can gain experience in this game, either killing an enemy, chipping away at the enemy, or using a staff. For the first two scenarios, the experience rewarded is related to the level difference between the player unit and the enemy unit. However, when using staves, you gain a fixed amount of experience. What this translates to is enemy kills becoming a lot less enticing as the map goes on, and using staves becomes a lot more worth it. So in these early stages of the map, we're going to try to get as many kills as possible with Lachesis. And then as we start to approach the end of the map, we're going to start staff spamming with her a lot more. The next group of enemies that we run into is Phillips Squad, and it's kind of tricky. It's a very difficult squadron to attack head on since most units can't one round KO these armor knights. So that's why we're having the Cavaliers go around it. Unfortunately, the Armor Knights like to box them in, so we're going to have Sigurd and Quan join back up to help protect them. This combat showcases why the ability to use higher tier weapons is such a boon to some units. Going up tiers of weapons in this game is generally objectively better. Silver weapons have 4 more might than steel weapons, and steel weapons have 4 more might than iron weapons. Unlike other Fire Emblem games, there is no difference between the hit rates on these weapons or the weight on these weapons. So if a unit can use a better tier of weapon, they're almost always better off using it. Do is going to give Lachesis the Thief Sword. A sword that has almost no utility on her, but will have some utility throughout the playthrough. It allows a unit that attacks an enemy with that weapon to steal all of their money. It's not super essential, but we will be using it from time to time. Generally speaking, it helps out when a unit has to spend a little bit more than normal on items, or if they're unable to clear an appropriate arena. The boss of the squad, Philip, is the first instance that we see of the Great Shield skill. It has a level percent chance of negating all damage that we would do to the user. This skill is probably the most annoying skill in genealogy, as almost every major boss in the game has access to it. There isn't really a good way to work around it either, only two weapons in the game can get through it, and we don't have access to either of them right now. But even if we did have access to them, they're not that intuitive to use, so pretty much any combat that we have against units with Great Shield is going to be inherently unreliable. Philip drops a return ring, and we want Quan to get that, so we're going to have Quan kill him. This will help Quan out when he needs to backtrack, but it's also a decent money dump on him. We bait the remaining Armor Knight enemies down south with Alex so that him and Lachesis can pick up some extra kills. This also allows Dew to get a bit of robbery in. Dude's going to dump money on Lachesis, which is the primary utility that thieves have in this game. The money cap in this game is 50,000 gold, and Lachesis starts out quite rich, and if Dude were to give her all of his money, you would actually go over that 50,000 gold. Luckily, this game is smart enough not to have that be a problem. Any money that Dude would have lost in a transaction like that goes back into his inventory. Funding around this can be pretty useful, as if done right, it'll allow Dude to make multiple money dumps in one trip. Greencastles are pretty interesting in this game. We can't warp to them, but we can use all their other utilities. We're going to take advantage of that by having Arden jump into the arena to lose all his HP. This is so we can get another heal in with Edain. The boss of Herhine is pretty bulky, and Sigurd is currently not built to take it on his own. We actually don't want Sigurd to fight it, because this boss drops a barrier ring, which we want to get on Ethlin. So by using the power of Quan and Ethlin, we're able to kill the boss from ranged. This allows Sigurd to seize with nothing in the way but a lone castle guard. Dude's going to give all of his money to Edain, but Edain doesn't need all the remaining money that he's accumulated up until now. This is where Dude's bargain skill comes into nice effect, and the reason why we left a ring in his inventory. Because Dude can buy items at their sell price, he can effectively buy useless items as a way of banking money. 
This way we can make sure that Edain only gets the money that she needs and none of it is wasted. And this ends up being the real value that the bargain skill will have on thieves in this game. Up next, we need to deal with Castle and Phony. Before that, Quan is going to give Finn the Brave Lance. The Brave Lance is a pretty powerful weapon that functions as though the user has the Adept skill with the 100% chance of success. In combination with Finn's Pursuit skill, this means that Finn will be able to attack four times whenever he fights enemies. Although the Brave Lance can be used by anyone, and Finn isn't necessarily the best user of it, he's the only one that can use it right now because there's no way that Finn can sell it to anybody. So during this part of the game, it may as well be his. One of the side objectives on this map that people may have noticed is the villages in the center which have been burning this entire time. Only one of those villages is actually important to us. It's the uh, one that starts burning initially. This village is notorious among casual players as it burns down by the end of turn 15. So if you take too long in that first castle siege, you'll never be able to get it in time. One of the ways that the developers plan for you to save this castle is by the two units that joined us, Lewin and Sylvia. Loon is a bard, which is kind of just a weird mage class in this game. He's not going to be too useful this run because he's still a footlocked unit. However, we do have a use for him in Chapter 5, so be on the lookout for that. Sylvia, however, is an essential unit to this run. She has the ability to give all units adjacent to her an extra turn. She is a footlocked unit, but honestly her ability is so good that it doesn't even matter, and it's well worth it to try and keep her around just to give units extra turns. It takes Lewin and Sylvia a minimum of three turns to reach the village that needs to be saved, and reliably it's going to take four. This would mean that you'd have to seize the first castle by turn 12 to have any chance of saving that village, and we seized it by turn 8, so we're good. However, something that's moderately funny is we're actually going to seize Anthony in four turns, which sort of negates the whole need to rush Lewin and Sylvia over to save that village, as the brigands are tied to Anthony Castle. So despite all the hard work that it looks like Lewin is doing down there, he's really contributing nothing. Right now we need to start talking about pairing again, as the Fire Emblem community seems pretty adamant about learning who at least one of these women is sleeping with. First up is Lachesis. Most casual players will recommend that we pair Lachesis with Beowulf. This is a terrible pairing for us, as we only care about the magic and resistance of Lachesis' daughter. Azel is the best statistically of the options we have available, but he is also rather impractical to pair. As it turns out, the best pairing for a run like this is Dew. He's not statistically much worse than Azel and can pair with Lachesis in 10 less turns. The main reason why we might want to pair Lachesis is it would allow us to pass the return staff down to her daughter. This would actually save us quite a bit of reliability in a later chapter, and I'll get more into why that would be the case, as it's related to an unavoidable glitch. However, at the time of recording this run, I wasn't aware of that glitch's existence, so instead I opted to not pair Lachesis at all. As mentioned previously, unlike other Fire Emblem games with pairings, you do get a substitute set of units if a unit remains unpaired. And the substitute for Lachesis' daughter is actually better in all the areas that we care about. There is one pairing with a unit that joins us next chapter that would theoretically be more useful. However, that pairing is very contested, and it isn't really practical for an LTC or efficiency run. The other parable unit that joined us is Sylvia, and luckily we don't need to pair her either. The only unit that we could pair with her is Alec, and he doesn't really provide anything. The reason we're leaving her unpaired though has nothing to do with her kid's stats and abilities compared to the substitutes. Instead it has to do with an item that the substitutes to her kids are able to obtain that we really want in this run. So even if she did have access to all the other pairings, it still wouldn't be worth it for this run. A huge squad of Sword Cavaliers comes in from the north. This is Volt Squad. These guys are honestly pretty weak, and because we have a Super Wumbo Finn, he doubles all of them with a Javelin, so this is a perfect chance to get Finn some kills on the Javelin. We actually need to use the Javelin here though, because one of the units in Volt Squad, Beowulf, is recruitable. Beowulf is a little bit better than these other Cavaliers, and he is not doubled by Finn with the Javelin. So we actually are using the Javelin mostly to weigh Finn down so he doesn't kill Beowulf. Finn's benchmarks here are pretty weird. In order to be able to do this with the Javelin, he needs 24 speed, which is 19 before the speed ring. This is something that no average Finn would really be capable of. We could replicate this strategy with the more modest Finn with the Steel Lance. However, we need to be careful that his speed is low enough that he doesn't double Beowulf, as that's the most important part here. 
The Cavaliers are three points of speed and two points of defense lower than Beowulf. So there are some strength benchmarks that Finn can hit that will two round KO the Cavaliers, but won't two round KO Beowulf. And he can do this with both the iron and steel lance at specific points. If his speed also turns out that he can't even double the sword Cavaliers, he can use the brave lance, which does have one less might than the steel lance. Overall, if you're wanting to make sure you can replicate the strategy, you should really look at what Finn's stats are when you're using him. Volts has an interesting item on him. It's the Paragon Ring. This ring doubles all the experience received by a unit that has it, similar to Lex's Paragon skill. This is probably the most important ring in the entire rank playthrough, and it's pretty much going to be the reason why we're able to meet the experience rank benchmark in the turn count that we do. Because the ring costs 40,000 gold and sells for 20,000, this is the primary reason why units need to have a lot of money. If a unit is able to clear an entire arena, they are awarded with 17,500 gold. Combine that with the 20,000 gold we'll get by selling the Paragon Ring, and we come up with about 2,500 gold short. Luckily, Genealogy also gives 1,000 gold for every castle that is seized, so for the most part, provided our units don't buy too much, they will be capable of keeping up monetarily with the Paragon Ring. The reason why we use the Paragon Ring primarily for the arena is the arenas give the most experience in the game, as the level of enemies in the arenas are higher than any enemies you'll see on the field. Medea recruits Beowulf. Beowulf's recruitment requires a unit pay him 10,000 gold. And none of our units really want to take this hit, but somebody has to and Medea was in range. To make up for this, Medea is going to kill the boss who drops a shield ring that sells for 10,000 gold. Though Medea is never actually going to sell this ring as we have other plans for it. Chapter 2 was cut into two parts, and we'll get to the second part at a later date. I'd like to thank you all for watching, and have a good day.